Eight talking points this week. There's one place and one place only to start, and that is with Bob Baffert and the positive drug test for an intra-articular joint medication that could have been a topical cream better methazone for the Kentucky Derby winner Medina Spirit, which, if the B sample comes back positive, will result in the horse's disqualification. That's the top line, Lee, but yeah. this has been an extraordinary story. Yeah, it's been a desperate week for American racing. Um, the Kentucky Derby is by far and away its biggest horse race, and Bob Baffert is by far and away the, the highest profile person in American horse racing. But again, and it is a case of, again, yet again, Bob Baffert has been caught up in a, in a negative story about a horse failing a post-race test. Um, and there's been something of a soap opera mm. about it this week, from Bob Baffert announcing the news um, in, a, in, a, in a press conference outside one of his Churchill Downs barns and painting himself there as the victim um, raising all sorts of potential explanations for what had happened, none of which really involved himself or his team, only to then later in the week to have to admit that potentially the uh, the test resulted from a uh, an ointment that was used um, on recommendation by one of his veterinarians. And I think as the week has gone on, you have become exasperated about the way Baffert has handled this, almost in a Trump-esque way of going on the, the, front, the front foot and falling over. Um, and it has, I think, raised the question of whether Bob Baffert, for all that he is an exceptional racehorse trainer, has become a bit of a liability to American racing. And there are certainly an awful lot of questions that have to be answered. So many questions. I think key questions surrounding whether there is systemic Yes. A systemic desire to gain a veterinary or medical edge that is beyond the boundaries of the law yeah. and or, and I think they're two separate questions, whether the sport as a whole globally needs to look at the whole question of how horses are medicated, why they're medicated and what the realistic thresholds are. But it's a, it's a yeah. huge area. I think that's area. absolutely right. And for Baffert, it's... It, this isn't about doping. It, it, this isn't about willfully trying to gain an advantage. It is presumably about very lax medication policies within the biggest stable in American horse racing. And unless mm. there is something untoward going on from outside his stable, then ultimately Baffert has to be held responsible. And neither the Team Bob camp nor people who are ardent anti-Baffert mm. um, commentators Nobody on either side of that debate seems to be able to rationally articulate the exact reason mm. why he's popped, you know, two dozen more um, yeah. positives. Yeah. Let's talk about crowds returning because you return to the race course tomorrow in in limited numbers. And we just hope against hope, really, that the 21st of June is the is the day when it all opens up. Yeah, it always seems to be one step forward, one step back. And this news of the India variant does raise significant concerns. We can only cross our fingers and hope for the best because tomorrow is a, is a really big day for, for this sport um, and for many other sectors as well. Um, but to get racegoers back on racecourses, not for the first time during this awful period. We had that patch, didn't we, in December. Mm. I remember being at Cheltenham during the December meeting where we had race goers back and it was Marvs and it's sand down on Tingle Creek. They'll get, it'll be a slightly more normal experience now, won't it, it from will. what we were told earlier in the week? Yeah, so those of us, Nick, who've been going racing um, during this period will have got to know green zones and amber zones and where you can go and where you can't go. They're, they're trying to pull apart those zones now and make it a more normal racing experience, getting owners back into, into parade rings. Um, and it is so important, with this phrase, the new normal, um, has gone with us since COVID came into our world. And in horse racing and being on a race course, it starts to feel a bit too normal and not so new mm. anymore. We need to break that and get the fans back because ultimately horse racing is entertainment. That's what it's all about. It's an industry, but it's a sport. It's about entertaining people. And without people to entertain, mm. there's almost no point it taking place. You couldn't say that owners haven't had their say. They have had more than their say. Yep. They haven't necessarily always had what they want. There is going to be different. There are going to be differences between racecourses as to how many are going to go and where and where they're going to be allowed. And and there is yeah. still 
it's still slightly opaque, that, isn't it? Yeah, and that's to a degree, it's inevitable, um, because different racecourses have different capacities, um, but also different racecourses are dealing with different local, local health authorities, which will have views of their own about what can and cannot happen. And you're right, uh, owners have had a terribly frustrating time, but, yeah. um, listening to what Pat Keogh was saying there about the situation in Ireland, However hard it's been for owners in British horse racing, owners in Irish horse racing have been completely locked out through this period. As my mother-in-law would say, Lee, you're lucky to have a face. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wise woman. Let, let's, let's talk about diversity. Yes, has your um, mother-in-law got views on this? You might have a view on this. Yeah. Um, she, she probably does, yes. yes. But um, I want to talk about it particularly this week because yeah. there has been a, I was going to say cross-party, there has been an, an industry-wide yes. document yeah. that has been signed up to by all the main stakeholders to continue the promotion of diversity within the sport. Yeah, absolutely. And since this diversity conversation began four years ago, and I know some find it completely exasperating, but um, I'm sorry it's important, since it began four years ago, Really, the, the, the biggest mission has, to get, has been to get the, the industry on board and on the same page and really committing to, to wanting to make things better. And that has been harder than you might think because people have different priorities. Um, but I think this statement this week um, with the, the eight different stakeholder groups, uh, including the participant groups, PGA, um, NTF, um, ROA, uh, National Association of Racing Staff, they've, they've made this commitment, which is really important, um, and I think they are increasingly understanding that it isn't a token gesture. It's not about satisfying those woke liberals who, who, who want to interfere with their sport. It's in their interest, because there's this huge group of people that at the moment don't feel any connection to horse racing. And if we can get those people into horse racing, then it's not just the woke liberals who feel better, it's everyone in the industry who will benefit from it because it's commercially good for them as well as morally good for the sport. And obviously you want people to see people, recognise people who are involved with the sport, who yeah. represent their communities. But also, how important do you think it is for particularly race courses, who should be community hubs, to get out into their communities and yeah. thereby be more representative? Don't wait for people to come to them. Absolutely right. And it's been a constant battle and Leicester has been in the news in the last 24 well, hours. But I, I remember going to do a... Uh, a, a colour piece um, at Leicester four, five, six years ago maybe because Leicester is one of the most multicultural cities in this country but you wouldn't know it looking at the race course and again there's a, there's a group of, there's a community there that if racing could access and, and tempt in then it's in everybody's benefit for that to happen I think, I think there's kind of, dare I say it there's quite, some quite boring work to be to be done yeah. by people get just getting out there yeah absolutely you know yeah. the, the 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 big campaigns are great but it's the it's all the little bits and pieces that go into it it is and i think if people that aren't that don't feel any sort of connection to horse racing or feel that horse racing isn't for them if some of those could experience the sort of days we'll get tomorrow at, at red car and leicester and windsor and carlisle and experience a day at the race and how fabulous it is um they would see that there's actually lots to lots to enjoy. Will you be on the Cleveland Riviera tomorrow? I'm actually going to Windsor as a race Funny goer that. tomorrow night. Funny that. I have right. been. To, I have been to Red. It's a it's a long way from Surrey. Yeah. Um, nice beach. Right, Defra. What are we talking about here? We are talking about um, the new animal welfare bill that has been yeah. brought uh, onto the statute in the uh, in the Queen's speech and how that might impact horse racing. Yeah, um, and it's a further example of. Parliament of that, that Westminster community increasingly focusing on on animal welfare um, and all the questions that arise from it. And in particular for, for horse racing, what's interesting is there was uh, special mention of racing within the, the death related animal welfare action plan. Um, and from that, the BHA has been speaking about uh, wanting to look at, in particular at the moment, why there's been a spike in fatalities in jump racing um, in the last 12 months or so. In March, um, 
we think, look, having done a bit of research to the Racing Post, that we, the, the Post thinks that over 30 horses died in March in jump racing, which would be more than double um, a normal March. And the BHA is now saying they want to go out into the summer jump season, do more pre-race testing. Um, really, I think not only is it, is it the right thing to do, but it's the right thing for the BHA to be seen to be doing as well, particularly, as I say, if you've got that Westminster community increasingly looking at animal welfare because racing has got a very positive message um, to give. This sport does an, an awful lot on animal welfare, as it should, and it, it, it's, it's absolutely fulfilling its brief, um, but we need... Westminster and other people to understand yeah. that. And if there's a spike, if there's a spike in equine fatalities, it has to be investigated. Absolutely, yeah. And it could just be a spike. These things are generally best looked at over five-year rolling periods. But if you get a spike, mm. as we got at um, Suddle, uh, was it last year yeah. in summer jumping? But when you have a spike, you, you, you absolutely should look at that's, it. That's how things are, not absolutely. how things look. That is absolutely yeah. how things are. Those yeah. horses have died. Yeah, and that, that needs to be examined because where, where, horse racing will never be a, a sport without fatalities, but you have to do all you can within reasonable limits to limit them. This is a subject that comes up time and time again. Breaks for jockeys. And, and the the debate has intensified surrounding this. Yeah, it's a, um, it's quite a quite a tricky balance to strike. If it was that easy, you'd just say take two weeks off there and take two weeks off there. Yeah, absolutely right, Nick. And if in the in the in the British and Irish racing, the two communities, if if, if Britain has been leading the way in terms of getting owners and racegoers back on on racecourses, then Ireland is leading the way in giving jockeys some time off during the year. Um, Ireland will have a 30-day a um, period with with no uh, with no need for with, with no jump racing for uh, the professional jockeys. There'll be some riders uh, who've ridden uh, uh, less than 15 winners or a conditionals who will have the opportunity to ride um, for some of those days. But basically, there'll be a long stretch in which Irish jump jockeys don't have to ride far longer than is the case in Britain for flat or jump jockeys. And the PJA, the Professional Jockeys Association, over here is absolutely adamant that for the mental health of jockeys, an elongated um, break would be hugely beneficial. Now, people against that view, perhaps racecourses, would say, well, no jockey is compelled no. to ride on any day. They're freelance operators. If you want to take a day off, if I want to take a day off, we can take a day off. Jockeys would say that's not how it works in their business. If they decide to take Tuesday off and a horse that they normally ride wins on Tuesday, they've lost that ride. It's a, it's a tricky well, one. Why is that different to any other freelance well, operator who works in the racing industry? I mean, I'd, I'd love racing to take a three-week break at some yeah. point in the year. It would make taking holiday pretty easy. Absolutely. And the, and the point you make there, Nick, highlights why this is a difficult, a difficult debate, um, particularly as there will be race courses who, whenever you find a, a window of 20, 21, 24, 25 days where you're not going to have racing in a particular code, that will be a period when certain race courses would normally be, be quite active. Um, there's probably a compromise to be reached, and as yet we haven't really got there. Okay, let's talk about racecourse profits and losses because, uh, yeah, there were assertions made on this program by Rafe Beckett and others, in fairness, that racecourses yeah. had made quite good money during COVID. I'm sure some racecourses have made a, yeah. a profit during during COVID. Other racecourses, most notably the larger independents, have made a loss, as York announced last week, though they were still able to offer fairly decent prize money for the Dante meeting and are probably an example of how most race courses should operate, but they're all different. Yeah, and this York is the absolute model of how any race course should operate. Um, their prize money is returning to pre-COVID levels for a lot of races this year, the, the group ones that the, the Ebor Festival being one such example. Yet, York lost in the last financial year, or its last financial year, two point six million pounds having made 2.4 million pounds the previous year so in effect a, a five million pound deficit there in in terms of what it was used to and i think for those the big race courses this has been a very painful year and just those words will frustrate a lot of participants who i'm sure think that race courses um, are still making huge profits. And as you say, some race courses and some race course groups won't have fared as badly at all during this period. Ironically, the, a lot of the smaller tracks whose income is more based on meteorites um, money 
won't have suffered in the way that the big tracks, who do depend on people coming through the turnstiles in, in tens of thousands of, uh, of people for an individual day's racing and then spending a fortune inside the race course, they really have been hit hard. Um, so it, it, this is very much not a one-size-fits-all story for race courses during COVID, but certainly tracks like Newbury and, and York and, and Goodwood and Asker and others have been hit really hard. And where you get somewhere like York, who are still finding the ability to pump money into prize money and do infrastructure work as well, you have to take your cap off to them. Yeah. The others need to follow. Affordability checks, uh, well, we've talked about this an awful lot, but it's come to the fore again this week because of um, Betfair customers, particularly high-end customers, yeah. um, complaining quite vociferously, Lee, about the inquisitive nature of uh, of, the, of the company when they're, they're asking them how they spend their money and yeah. you know, just just very in, intrusive questions. It's almost like you're filling in a mortgage application. Yeah, and to, I think some of them would say it's even more so, even more in, 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 um, intrusive than that. And what's interesting, Nick, is that this comes at a time when it's been um, revealed that the the gambling commission has been uh, released um, from its uh, investigation and research into affordability checks. That's coming more within government remit. And I think that has been uh, deemed by the industry, by the racing industry and the bookmaking industry to be, to be good news. And yet um, you have got bookmakers, Betfair being the one that's been highlighted most recently, taking part in very intrusive checks um, in customers and asking questions of them that a lot of customers will feel very reluctant to answer indeed. And there's, from what we can see, again, I use that phrase of one size fits all, what one bookmaker does with a customer is very different to what another bookmaker does with a customer. Um, and it's a serious problem. It will turn some punters off horse racing um, and it does raise questions about why certain bookmakers are taking a different approach to this than other bookmakers. And I would broaden it out as well, Nick, in terms of if we're saying that um, we, 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 we're worried that this is happening, we should also be worried that, that punters are being put off by, uh, again, things like having their accounts closed, by having their bets limited. Um, in so many ways... There are dangers that the this sport is is alienating a lot of its key customers, and for everybody that is really worrying. So about National Racehorse Week, Richard Phillips will be along very shortly. It was his idea, and it's been picked up and run with, and that's great. It is, and it sort of ties if we go higher up that list back to the Defra story, um, Nick, because horse racing has a really strong positive message. To send out, you will always get um, negative stories and bad news stories because in any group of people there are going to be a few bad eggs. That's that's inevitable. But in general, you go into any racing yard and you will be bowled over by how well looked after the equine athletes in our sport are. And Richard Phillips hit upon an idea which he'll talk to you about when he, when he sits in his chair, Nick, back in a Racing Post column two years ago, mm. that how good would it be if we could celebrate that in a National Racehorse Week? And under the, sort of powered by Great British Racing, um, that's going to happen in, in a week in, in September. It will tie in with various um, racehorse open days, uh, racing, racing centre open days across the country, including the, the big one in in Newmarket and it will be a chance for for this industry to tell people who maybe don't know so much about horse racing um, that this is a great sport that we look after animals really really well and come inside and have a look because I'm sure the aim will be to get as many yards open as possible all around the country and get people inside those yards and see just how well just how good a life racehorses lead there. All, all of that and I, I never asked you about the Magnolia Cup no, the Magnolia Cup. Apparently, it, it's drawn a, a, an interesting field, I believe. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 the Magnolia Cup. I, I, Khadijah Mellor was such a good story um, two years ago. It was, a, it was a wonderful story that took racing into um, different places, different, different 
uh, different communities, different 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 platforms for covering the sport. But the Magnolia Cup has always been a very Goodwood creation. Um, and although there are reasons why this year's field um, might look like it does in terms of the fact uh, that people haven't been able to go out and learn to write in the last year or so, which is often the need for a, a charity race of this kind, Khadija Mella very much broke the mould for the Magnolia Cup. And this year's Magnolia Cup looks much more like a traditional Magnolia Cup. And I think that is probably very much a, a good wood thing. It's not a, it doesn't reflect horse racing, but it may well reflect the Magnolia Cup in its, in its old form. And the people who are participating in it are raising a lot of money. For They're charity. raising a and huge amount of money for charity. And in that sense, and this is the, much the most important sense, it's a great thing and they have done nothing wrong. Indeed, they've done a, a wonderful thing and a lot of people will benefit from it and good luck to them all. Those were this week's Talking Points.